morning, everyone. The fact that we've come in from the Art of Living session, I just thought it's good to look at one of the things in that session was about introspection, about how to de-stress. From yesterday, from uh, Beek's first presentation, everybody has been talking about what does it mean for us in the retail industry to start going back to what the consumer really wants and what impact that has. So I think it, this is a session where we can introspect a little bit more on that with this panel. And I'd first like to invite Simon to talk through his presentation of customer-centric retailing. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be here this morning. I've got to say, uh, I've been to quite a few conferences across Asia over the last six months or so. Um, and the, the passion, the energy, uh, the interest uh, at the IRF is, is quite refreshing. It's quite outstanding. Um, so, yeah, I'm delighted to be part of it. And I, I do hope that you find this session engaging and interesting. Um, I want to set the scene and I want to tell you a little bit about uh, how to become customer centric, what customer centric really means for a retailer, um, how you can get to know your customers better uh, and how you can make that information live and breathe within your stores. Um, to set the scene, I work for a business called Dunhumby. Um, we really only do one thing, we're, we're a consultancy that's focused on uh, using transactional data to, to understand customers. Uh, we've been around for a while. We work in about 28 markets at the moment, um, including India, including China, including three or four other Asian countries. Now, my, my goal really is to make you think a bit differently. Um, and I firmly believe that the biggest danger that we face as managers and retailers um, is not what we don't know. It's what we thought we knew for sure, but actually, it just wasn't the case. And as an example of this, I want you to think about loyalty, and I want you to think about the loyalty schemes, which I know uh, a lot of retailers either already have or are considering adopting or are in the process of launching. And I visited India a couple of times over the last year. I'm not an expert on India at all, but I visited a few times and I had a few conversations. Uh, and I see there's a little bit of confusion uh, about what a loyalty scheme actually is. Um, you ask people, describe your loyalty scheme, and people talk about points programs, they talk about CRM, they talk about communications, uh, they talk about incentives, they talk about experience, advocacy. You then ask, well, what's the point of having it? What's the benefit that it brings? Uh, and people talk about, well, 60% of my sales go through on the scheme, or I gave out a trillion points last year, um, or I've got three promotions per week in my leaflets that are only for, for loyal customers. They don't talk about, well, my sales have gone up 2% since I launched the scheme. Um, they don't talk about, well, my customers are now 5% more loyal. Uh, or my satisfaction has increased 3% because of the scheme. The purpose of having a loyalty scheme is to grow loyalty. If we can't measure that, if we don't know that our scheme has had that impact, we've really got to think, well, why, why did we do this? Um, have we made a mistake? Should I be rethinking my approach to this loyalty scheme? Because they're expensive. Uh, and if we don't get a return, if we can't prove the return, you know, we need to kind of really rethink We also see that a lot of schemes that people have can become quite mechanical. Uh, people get obsessed with the operational aspects of the scheme, the technology that underpins the scheme, uh, the communications that go alongside the scheme. Uh, and they become a bit clunky, not very natural, not something that really lives and breathes within the organization. One approach to changing this is to really go back to basics. Um, a lot of people over the last day, and I'm sure through the course of today as well, have talked about customers and talked about how we must do what's right for customers. Now, really, the prime goal of a loyalty scheme is to enable us to do that, is to enable us to understand our customers better. Um, we've worked with probably in excess of 40 to 50 schemes around the world. Uh, and by and large, we see that uh, viewed as just a, a way of giving a discount, a way of giving points, a way of rewarding customers, 
At best, you'll have a one-to-one -one return. So you give $100 out in points, you'll get $100 back in through the till. It's a break-even situation. The real skill and the real power is using that data uh, in a clever way uh, and in a way that you know, reflects what customers want within your stores. And with a bit of imagination uh, and with the right kind of analysis, the right kind of segmentations, it is pretty astounding what transactional data can tell you about your customers. Um, so for example, uh, through looking at transactional data, you can tell, is somebody price sensitive? Are they affluent? You can see if they like promotions. You can see if they like big brands. Uh, you can see if they're quite adventurous in how they cook. You can see if they do a lot of entertaining. You can see if they've got a big family, if they've got a baby, if they've got a pet. You can see what kind of hobbies they have. You can see if they're health conscious. Do they like convenience food? Information that, from a marketing point of view, is absolute gold dust. Um, it tells you exactly what's important to this customer. It tells you what kind of messaging to use. It tells you what kind of promotions, what kind of products they're going to respond to if you give them an offer on it. But even outside of marketing, this information has got direct relevance to how you set out your store. Stores are a bit like a battlefield. There's a huge amount of confusion. Um, customers struggle to find the products that they want. They don't understand the way a store is laid out. They don't understand the adjacencies that they see. Really, our goal, if we're going to become customer-centric, is to make this environment easy for the friend that we know. And we do know this person because we can see uh, a pretty intimate part of their lives, what they choose to pick up, what they choose to ignore when they go shopping. And I want to give you some examples of how this actually works on the ground in a store. If you look at the products that somebody buys, and you look at the products that they don't buy, you can build up an idea of what products they would substitute between and what products they would definitely never substitute between. For example, shopper goes in, they're looking to buy product A, it's not available, they switch to product B, but they would never switch to product D. Based on that kind of science, you can build up a very detailed view of what the customer decision tree is. Should we be ranging the category by brand should it be by pack size? Should it be by flavor variant? Should it be by price point? Traditionally, those kind of questions are answered by research, and research uh, is normally limited to a small sample size, and it's completely dependent on people being honest uh, in the questions that you ask. Taking this approach, it's much more data-driven, it's much more scientific, it's based on the facts of how people are behaving. Uh, and this is an example from, it's actually milk category. Um, where the category used to be built around brands, uh, which suppliers incidentally very much favor. They love to see a category with clear brand blocking within it. Um, however, when you look at how people shop the category, the truth is often quite different. Uh, and we re-merchandised this category uh, so that it was now merchandised by function. Uh, and just by making what is a reasonably simple change within the store, suddenly that category becomes easier to shop. Customers understand it. Customers see the products that they want more easily, uh, and you see between a 5 to 10% uplift in the category sales. So it's an example. We've understood our customers. We've understood how they're shopping their category, and we've made that category easier for them. Price is a hugely important driver of where people shop. Uh, at some level, everybody is sensitive to price. However, some people are more sensitive than others. Uh, I guarantee that within your customer base at the moment, There'll be a section of people who are maybe less affluent, maybe have a larger family. Keeping to a budget is absolutely critical. There'll be another segment of people for whom a bit more upmarket, a bit more affluent. They're actually more interested in quality, uh, in the provenance of the products, in the convenience, in the choice, in being excited in what they see in the store. Now, understanding those two groups of people and understanding what they buy changes hugely uh, the way that you lay out the store, the way that you merchandise the products, the way you promote the products. Uh, in this example, we saw category sales declining. It was in laundry detergent. And we couldn't work out why until we looked at the customers who were shopping. Uh, and you could see very clearly it's those price-sensitive customers that were driving that decline. Now, we hadn't changed the range. 
we hadn't changed the price points, but what we had done is take space away from key products that were bought by that customer group. So all we had to do was put that space back, give more space to the products that these people wanted. Suddenly, they could see them as they were walking past the aisle. Suddenly, the availability got better on them. Sales uplift 16%, volume uplift 48%. Simple changes based on understanding your customers and understanding what's driving a change. Once you've understood the group of customers who really, really care about price, you can then look at the products that they're buying. All retailers want to be known as the market leaders for price. They want to have a very strong price image. The way you influence price image is by being cheaper or at least being on the market average for the group of customers that really, really care about price. And we know the products they buy. Typically, it's quite a small repertoire, maybe only two to 300 lines um, out of a SKU list of tens of thousands. And we can afford to be cheaper when it's just a reduced list. In fact, we can even pay for being cheaper by floating the, the price on the lines which are bought by more upmarket customers. So we know the products bought by people who are price sensitive. We can be cheaper on those, and we can pay for it by being a bit more expensive on the products that are bought by people who don't care so much about price. This kind of thinking probably has worked uh, the best in, in our kind of experience with Tesco in the UK. Tesco were facing a price war um, against Asda, uh, which is essentially Walmart. Um, and they couldn't afford to, to match Asda across the whole stores. Uh, but using this approach, we could identify the subset of products which was absolutely vital to match on uh, because those were the products that customers would really, really notice. Uh, and by doing that, our price perception actually increased uh, over the period, and we could do it in a way that did not destroy our margin. Promotions. Promotions are a hugely important part of retailers' business. As much as 30 to 50% of sales might be going through on a promotion. We found, though, that there's very little science that goes behind understanding what products to put on promotion. Often, the decision is based on, well, what's the supplier going to pay for? Um, the supplier's going to give me a little bit of back margin to put my product on the, the leaflets or to put it on gondola end. The voice of the customer is absolutely lost. Simply by understanding the promotions which create a sales uplift or the promotions which see an increase in basket or customer penetration uh, when they're running, you can see a drastic improvement in the sales performance of a promotional strategy. Now, You've got to balance that. You can't just turn off promotions which are, are generating back margin. But you can, over time, move away from a back margin to a front margin uh, dominated promotional strategy. And it's good for customers. You're suddenly promoting lines which customers actually want to buy. Uh, this is an example from the co-op in Norway, uh, where by taking this approach, if you look at the, the chart in the bottom right, we saw the reach of the, the leaflet. Um, so it was a promotional flyer went out every couple of weeks. Uh, nearly doubled um, after we started running promotions that customers actually wanted to buy. And so we doubled the number of customers that were buying something from this leaflet. And you can imagine the impact on customer satisfaction. Suddenly you're receiving a promotional flyer that's got something on it that is relevant to you. Targeted communications is one of the mainstays of being customer-centric, one of the mainstays uh, of most of your loyalty scheme. We've seen over the years that the targeting of these communications evolved from, in the early days, being very acquisition focused, uh, both from a brand and a retailer's point of view. Uh, we want to bring customers into the store, or a brand wants to get customers to switch from brand A to brand B. We've now learned, though, that actually by being loyalty focused and by rewarding customers for purchases that they want to make, you get much, much more of a return. Uh, and we've seen that because actually customers repertoire shop much more than they used to. So instead of saying, well, I'm either a brand A loyal customer or a brand B loyal customers, customers switch between the two. And by rewarding their loyalty, we're giving them just one more reason to shop brand A more than brand B. This is an example from Kroger in the US. Kroger are number two in the US behind Walmart. Uh, and we run these communications uh, about 10 times a year at the moment. Nine and a half million people receive, and it's a paper-based mailing. The Americans love their paper-based. 
uh, and every single customer receives a unique combination of offers within this mailing. Um, so it's 14 to 24 coupons, and every single customer receives a different combination of those coupons. Results speak for themselves. Participation, 64%. So nearly two-thirds of our customers participate in this. Uh, and the return is $3.6 for every dollar that this costs. Doesn't sound great. However, that one dollar that's invested is invested by the supplier community. Um, suppliers see that when one of their brands is featured in these communications, they see a sales uplift. So they're desperate to be included, and they will pay to be included. So it's a real win-win-win. Retail is happy. Uh, they see the sales uplift in the store. Suppliers happy. They see their products going up. Uh, and the customer's happy. Customers are receiving offers on products that we know they like, uh, or on brands we know they like, on categories we know they like. We took um, a control group about five years ago uh, within Kroger. So it was about 50,000 people out of a base of uh, 10 million or so. Uh, and we excluded them uh, from all targeted communications. And over that five-year period, we used that control group to measure the impact of communications. Uh, and it's shown 8.6 billion sales uh, incrementally just through targeted communications. So it's a massively powerful way of talking to customers. As I say, I'm not an expert in India, but I would hazard a guess. I've been in China for the last four years, and the postal system in China is extremely unreliable. Um, I would imagine India is a bit variable too. Um, but the channel of delivery of these messages really doesn't matter. Um, the principle is to keep the message targeted, keep it relevant to the customer, whether it's delivered by paper, by email, SMS, MMS, through an app, doesn't matter, provided the customer receives it, it's relevant to them, and they can redeem it in the store. And this is how retailers can really put customers at the center of their business. So to become customer-centric, you've got to have three different areas that are all in play. First of all, you've got to have data, and you've got to have the ability to generate insights from that data. Secondly, those insights have got to be actionable. You've got to be able to personalize the experience of the customer. Now, that can be through targeted comms. It can be through changing the ranges. It can be through changing the layout of the store. It can be different price points. It can be different promotions. Customers have to feel when they go into the store that they can shop it easily, they can understand it easily. They've got to feel through the communications that they receive that you understand them and that you're on their side. And then finally, you need to change the culture of your organization so that customer is really at the center from the top of the business down to the bottom of the business. Being customer-centric should live as much in the boardroom as it does on the shop floor. If the CEO, if members of the board aren't 100% behind this, then it's not going to flow through the organization. It's not going to make the kind of change that we've seen it make in businesses like Macy's, Tesco, Kroger, Exeter. Best example of the organizational change, uh, again, it's from Kroger, where members of the board in Kroger, their bonus is now dependent on making increases in customer loyalty. Uh, so we measure customer loyalty on an eight-week basis, and we measure it every quarter. Uh, and their financial package, their take-home pay, varies depending on how much that measure is going up or going down. Very clear commitment from the most senior level in the business that this is important, and this is a measure that the business is going to use. When this works, when retailers do this properly, you create measurable value, and you do it quickly. Um, over the course of an engagement, we would typically expect to see half a percent rising to 5% like-for-like sales benefit based from taking this kind of approach. Another example from Kroger. So Kroger adopted a customer-centric strategy round about here. Blue line is Kroger's growth. Red line is Walmart's growth. Uh, and it's a spectacular success. Over the last 33 quarters, uh, Kroger's had successive growth, and that's through a period of you know, huge uh, turmoil in the, the U.S. market. The most astounding feature of this, though, for me, is that 95% of Kroger's growth has come from existing customers. So these are the people who are already walking in the door before Kroger took this action. However, Kroger were only getting a portion of their spend 
you know, even your most loyal customers today, they're probably only spending 40, 50 percent of their total wallet size with you. If you increase that to 60, 70 percent, then you can see a huge like-for-like -like impact. And you should be able to increase it because you know these people. You've got their information. You know what they're buying. You know something about them. That's far more easy to leverage than bringing in somebody cold off the street who you know nothing about. It occurred to me yesterday, attending a lot of the, the presentations, that you know, the future's bright in India. Um, the economy's growing. Retail seems to be growing. A natural question to ask is, where we're talking about a new strategy, a customer-centric strategy, why? Why would I bother? Um, I'm doing okay. If it isn't broken, then don't fix it. And I think that's a great question, and I don't have all the answers to that. I think it would be a, a good question for the panel to discuss. Um, but here are some thoughts. Actually, one retailer that I talked to yesterday said, um, yeah, I like loyalty, um, but I'm not sure that it's really going to step change my business. If I wanted loyalty, um, I'd buy a bloody dog. <laughs> I thought it was quite a nice quote. But we think there's four reasons for seriously becoming customer-centric. One, people are growing at the moment, but why grow at 10% when you can grow at 15%? Hard cash-based region. You can make more money if you put customers at the center of your business. Secondly, and there's been lots of animated discussion uh, about FDI and what that means, but really becoming customer-centric does arm you against the future. Um, I can see two things that are going to happen in the future in Indian retail with almost certainty. One, uh, retailers are going to compete more and more against each other, um, particularly in the bigger cities uh, where the most affluent customers will live uh, and where the kind of most uh, sought-after estates will, will be. People are going to look for more of a point of differentiation, and we see this in China at the moment. Uh, in China, there's lots of reasonably large regional players and they've all got national aspirations, uh, and they know that at some point they're going to butt up against each other. Uh, and they're looking forward to, well, what's going to be my point of differentiation at that stage? And customer centricity is a very powerful point. of Thirdly, if customers like you, they are more likely to take more services from you. Um, example, Tesco have got a bank, which is now the second largest retail bank in the UK. Um, they provide telecoms and they've got drugstores in store. They even provide funerals these days. Uh, and they've based all of these brand extensions on a solid understanding of what their customers want, uh, who should be targeted for these extensions, what kind of messaging to use, and it's worked for them. And then the last point is a bit more philosophical, really. What kind of business do you want to be? Morally, it's quite a nice place to be a business that puts the needs of customers first. Uh, and for me, this comes down to, if you're in a meeting, what kind of conversations do you want to have? Do you want to be asking, how can I give my customers what they want? Or do you want to be asking, how can I get my customers to do what I want? A customer-centric business will always be thinking, how do I give my customers what they want? And I think that's just a nicer kind of environment and nicer business to be in. That's all I've got to say. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, so we're now going to hand over to Ashish and go into a panel discussion. Thank you. I'd like to keep this uh, session a bit interactive just because there's a lot of people in the house and customer centricity and consumer understanding is probably something we're all interested. So any, any first questions from, for Simon? Uh, then we can take it to the panel. I can do air traffic control. So Simon, just to wind up with what you said. There seem to be three three things that come out from, from your session, right? One is customer centricity is a strategic choice. It's top down, the organization needs to be bought into it. The second is the customer actually tells you from the data that we get based on them walking to the store and buying a brand and showing up at a retailer what their preferences are, what they're really interested in. And I guess the third is that loyalty programs can be made profitable if you embed it into the system and then you can drive you, you can you can actually use it in merchandising decisions you can use it in marketing decisions and drive the business based on that what about the relationships in your experience from you know the retailers that we, you work with is there something to do with relationships when you say what's top down for a tesco or a kroger what kind of relationship do you need to be able to drive this customer centric approach fundamentally uh, what needs to be in place is the vision 
that becoming customer centric isn't just a marketing function. Um, it's not just a small part of the business that sits with a loyalty scheme. It's something that's got to be bought into right at the top of the business. And if that vision is there, then everything else can fall into place. So all of the relationships um, you know, with the, the delivery functions, uh, be they within marketing, be they within commercial, be they within the supply relationship side, they can fall into place. But that vision, that strategic intent has to be there and it has to be very clear uh, at the top of the business. You know, when I also hear from Shopper Stop and Sumit, I just want to play that back to you. I mean, when you look at it, Vinay, you, you have something on Shopper Stop where you're looking at loyalty programs for a while. How, how do you look at it in terms of uh, integrated approach within the organization? To, to begin with, I, I completely agree with, uh, you know, Ashish and Simon. It's, uh, this is uh, analytics or loyalty is really, uh, for us in Shopper Stop, it is part of our integral part of our strategy and life. It's not a department. It is not a set of people who run numbers. Uh, in fact, I'd go as far as to say that run, running numbers is the least of the job of a good quality analytics person. We are lucky. We have a very large uh, loyalty base, we have about almost 2.7 million. Uh, it's also one of the oldest in the country. We have data going back 15 years on customers. So I can tell you exactly what denims you wore in 96, what you moved to, what you're wearing today, and I can give you a pretty reasonably good guess on what you might buy two years from now. So a whole lot of transactional data is uh, what we have. You know, for the purpose, you guys are all retailers here, you know the problems and the stress that all of us go through. I thought, let me just illustrate to you through two simple examples as to what we do. We don't do anything which is rocket science. Uh, I am a stats guy by profession before, but very little stats involved in any analytics that, that, that we do. It's a very simple business problem. So let me give you an example. A lot of what we do is around analyzing uh, categories. Uh, we do not start by asking a question. Uh, I was asked this question a week ago. What's happening in the kids' wear apparel these days? We don't ask questions like this. We start with a hypothesis. And a very simple hypothesis which says that, for example, that every male who walks into our store to buy formal shirts must also buy trousers. Sure, he's wearing it. We, we then discover that a large chunk of males who are clearly corporate people or business people are buying corporate shirts, but not trousers. The most simple insight on earth. You know, as retailers, all of us know that when people buy shoes, what do they buy? Socks, right? Everybody knows that. But some of these things you can't just see by observation. So, for example, we figured out in one of our largest stores at Mallard that uh, when women come and buy SKD, which is Salwar Kameez Dupatta, that's an Indian suit yeah, uh, for you, Simon, the Indian dress, uh, they also buy footwear and uh, you know footwear uh, it's a huge store it's a one lakh twenty five thousand square feet store footwear was a good four and a half minutes walk away from skd and we figured that if they are so adjacent as categories one we just put them together we got a 25 percent increase on sale by doing that yeah so that was that was one example we did very simple work on men's shirts and trousers so for example we communicated to a person who wasn't buying trousers to us uh, we didn't just communicate that, hey, we've got great trousers. We looked at what else he buys. So when he buys shirts from us, we realized he buys, whenever new brands come into the store, he buys those. So we said, okay, let's communicate to him new brands. Uh, there was another person in that same base who wasn't buying trousers. We figured that he is excited by, when he comes to the store, he buys three or four shirts at a time. So we said, okay, let's give him a focused personalized offer on upgrading and buying more. There was another guy who was very interested in kinds of fits that are there. So we, we showed him visuals of fits available. Simple exercise gave us about 12 crores of incremental turnover on what Simon called the control group. So to people who were not communicated and against who were communicated, 12 crores increase. One, that's one simple example. Let me give you one more which we've done very recently. Uh, working women, we realize, and there are a lot of working women I can clearly see in this room big segment of business for us. In fact, I would say it's the fastest growing large segment. Uh, you know, a lot of people say do segmentation and uh, we did it in a very actionable basis. So we picked up working women. We saw how are they different. We figured working women buy more ladies Western apparel. Obvious, uh, intuitively uh, correct. They buy a lot of cosmetics clearly because they go into office. There is a need to do a lot of presentation. They're outgoing. They buy a whole lot of makeup, fragrances, all of that understood. Take a guess as to one category which working women buy more than their housewife counterpart. Any guesses? Handbags? Yeah, again intuitive. Yeah, it's something which you would imagine. You won't believe this, but kids' toys. 
is bought more by working women compared to their housewife counterparts. I am not a psycho a psychoanalyst, so I'm not going to give you the theory uh, behind why that may be happening and what is the guilt and all of that. But I think insights like this, and uh, we are very clear in our program, we call it the first insight program, that the bias is towards action. And I'm not a librarian of insights. I don't generate insights on the fly. And I only generate insights which I believe are actionable. And I have a very clear monetary target for monetizing those uh, uh, insight. So that's a little bit about our personal experience. Yeah, it's a, it's a completely different business, the grocery business. We run our program. Our program is about five years old. We have close to about five million uh, members at this point of time. Uh, the program essentially is very much about understanding A, who my shopper is. What does he buy? How does he buy? Similar way as what Vinay was talking about, but again, fantastic insights, absolutely fantastic insights. Uh, w one of the interesting things uh, that uh, we've been doing recently is that we realized that there is need for a, a build, a build or, or a scheme or, or a program within the program, okay, which talked about next month's purchases because it's a periodic business, right? So what we discovered and what we realized, and it's, it's somewhat similar, uh, Simon, to the Kroger uh, coupon program. Uh, we started uh, handing out booklets for next month's purchase this month. Absolutely fantastic response. Only five months we've been into it. Last month we gave out 320,000 booklets in our stores. We got an 18% response. Now mind you, Simon, these are not personalized at this point of time. But yes, there is a bit of research gone in, there's a bit of analytics gone in to understand what the kind of products my club mode members in generic buy. They are configured at a city level, so they're not national. So yes, there is a level of understanding of what we are trying to do in each city or how my shopper is behaving in each city. And fantastic activity rates, nowhere close to 70, 80%, but from a loyalty program, 18% in the first three, four months is absolutely brilliant. And what's more, that booklet has close to about 20 odd coupons. We're getting an activity rate of almost three and a half to four coupons for every single member who's coming and redeeming. That is a very, very, very high activity rate. And of course, we have great plans in terms of what we can do with it. The other thing we do is, and of course, it's of great value from our perspective, is that, uh, of course, we analyze and we, we, we create lots of insights around it. Without going into them, what we've realized is that it is of immense value not only to us, but our business partners as well which is essentially, in our case, the FMCG companies. So we've created a platform, which we've already talking to many FMCG companies, and some have already bought in, is that here's a tool, Mr. Brand Manager, which can come and reside on your desktop, and you can play with it. You can understand what those 5 million shoppers are doing, how are they buying, what product are they buying. You launched a new variant. Did it cannibalize your other brand or your other variant? Your competitor launched a new product. Your core customer base try that new product. Did they stay with it or did they come back? How many of them stayed with the new product? How many of them came back? So on and so forth. All kinds of understanding of the shopper. So that's a brief about our program. One takeaway I have is should go buy four shirts, no pants, and I'll get a discount from Shopper Stop, right? Um, so I think we hear from, you know, retailers that you're actually seeing programs being built in. Uh, Professor Sid, I just wanted to, you know, turn it over to you a bit and say, what about the customers? You know, yesterday you were talking about switching costs for customer is zero. There's a lot of transition happening. Are customers in India ready for looking at this loyalty program? Do they actually value it? This is, this is exactly the challenge that we as retailers have. When the switching cost is zero, how do I retain my customers? That's, that's, that's what the challenge is, right? Now this is where, this is where I think, let me take a step, two steps back and be an academic here, which I am, and bring in something here. <clears throat> Any one of us, when we look at the retail trade, we are looking at such a macro level. Unfortunately, customer doesn't worry about macro. Customer says, this is my store, this is my store, this is my store, which one do I buy? For? That's one. So therefore, to start with, it's always one-to-one -one relationship for the customer. We may be talking to the world, but customer is always building a one-to-one -one relationship. As they say, one to many is flirting. And customer doesn't flirt. That's a problem. Maybe in the beginning years, beginning time, they will try, but ultimately, 
uh, in the head, they are very clear that this is what they would like to buy it from. And so when we look at, therefore, if we look at what customers and if you look at store by store, each store has a catchment area. That catchment area never grows at a rate at which you would like your business to grow. So how do I grow my business, therefore, in the same catchment area? And catchment area doesn't, or trading area doesn't just expand like this. In fact, it, it shrinks with time because your competition coming in, right? You have customers moving out, customers moving in, all that. So trading area, each of my store, therefore, because customer doesn't buy from the chain, customer buys from a store. So for me, loyalty is not national level loyalty. Loyalty is within the trading area. Am I able to hold that customer or not? And, and what I'm finding that the faster you succeed, faster you actually exhaust potential and faster you invite competition. So if that is what it is, and, and we have all noticed that the next store comes, always gets started very adjacent to the most successful store. Right? So therefore the customers are going to get choices. Which means if I am looking at my customers, I have to look at my existing customers and I have to also look at new customers. When we are looking at data, data gives, tells me only about the existing customer, it doesn't tell me about the new customers. So my, 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 my objective therefore is how do I maximize my profits from the existing customers and how do I reduce the cost of acquisition of the new customer so that my return on marketing investment is what is, what, what, what is maximized. And in, in my opinion, the data that we have about the customers about the marketplace is what is going to help me in that so that I can target it and my return on investment is as high as possible. Vikas, what about your experience with your, you know global retailers again when you look at customers? Do they again, when you bring in the loyalty measures, is there an ROI on it that we look at from a customer-centric standpoint? Uh, you've heard insights you know, from uh, Vinay and Sumit on what happens with uh, what you can do with data. I'd like to share something, uh, what we do with data globally. Um, you know, we essentially use data to connect the dots. So we look at transactional data, behavioral data, attitudinal data, uh, and we try and draw a holistic picture of the customer, which leads all the way down to customer engagement and brand experience. So it's far more than acquisition or retention that loyalty talks about. Uh, we, we obviously like to believe uh, data is the new oil. What do you do with that oil? Uh, you know, I would say get a massage. Well, I'll extend the corny joke. I uh, coined an acronym, which is uh, what are the best practices for uh, using data and the new oil, which is SPA, speed, personalization, and awards. So with respect to speed, some insights we've got. We do some work for Etihad in the Middle East, and we found that 75% uh, of your most engaged customers actually signed up within the first 90 days of the program, even five years out. Something else we do with respect to speed is timing, which is uh, in combination with digital. Today, if you go and check in on four, uh, on Foursquare at a Marriott hotel, right, we would actually connect that with offers that we have from local merchants around, you know, restaurants, um, and sightseeing and actually give you real time offers the minute you check in as SMS or an, or an app on a mobile. So that's really about speed and timing. Uh, and clearly the marketers here that are sending us SMSs at 3 a.m., that's not working, right? Um, with respect to uh, personalization, um, you know, we believe in one-on-one uh, -on -one personalization and we deliver it. So we deliver about 12 million personalized offers to about 15 million customers in the UK. That's the level of personalization that we go into. Uh, closer to home, uh, why personalization is key. Uh, we run the Taj Hotels program. We find that 10,000 of the top customers deliver 20% of the revenue of Taj Hotels. Right? We know which hotels they go to at what time of the year, what floor and what room do they specifically like, what's, and what pillow type, is it hard or soft, do they, do they actually like. Um, taking uh, an example from our Nectar uh, base, we, for every pound of promotions that we deliver, uh, we get back a pound 62 
in returns. So we've actually upped Sainsbury's sales by about $500 million by reducing promotion costs by 5%. Right? And there are two key segments that we find very useful to communicate to. One that we might identify with, they're called the middle-aged but health-conscious buyers. The other ones that some of us who are a little more immodest might identify with, who are called the wealthy achievers. So that's really where the UK, uh, some of the learnings are. And finally, with respect to awards, uh, you know, it's essentially rewards, but how do you make the customer taste blood and then have them really come back to you? So we deliver about $1.5 billion of rewards annually. Uh, and there's a deep insight on what the customer really wants. Uh, interesting things, for example, that the customer always wants perceived value to be much larger than what you think you're giving them. So that translates into 50% of our rewards in this delivered from CPG. So we do, you know, Pampers and Coke and all of this sort of stuff actually comes from customers redeeming for sweepstakes. So really, you know, lottery tickets or raffle tickets really and saying, look, I can get perceived much more value. Right? And finally, on the Nectar program, uh, we deliver a very holistic reward basket, which is in a year, an average member in the UK gets about uh, 10 cups of coffee, which is, let's say, for himself. Uh, he gets about uh, two cinema tickets, let's say, to entertain the wife. He gets about eight tickets to the zoo to take the family out. Uh, and he gets uh, one flight ticket to send the mother-in-law back home. Hi, uh, my name is Rajiv Shetri. Uh, I just had a you know, simple question. I mean, the examples which you all are giving is related to multi-brand and multi-category stores. You know, you talk about Kruger, you talk about Lifestyle, Shopper Store. These stores have multi-brands. And as Professor said, you know, there's a switching cost is zero, as well as brand loyalty is dead. We don't hear examples of, you know, brands which are predominantly present in the mono brand space. Okay, the majority of the business comes from their exclusive stores. Having a, su a successful loyalty program, you know, you've not heard, I personally have not heard about. So what do you think mono brand stores should do? Because, you know, um, as keeping the uh, two points, which is switching cost is zero and brand loyalty is dead, what do you guys think or feel that mono brand uh, stores should do in, in order to, you know, have, get the consumers coming back again and again? Um, I think I've got a pretty simple answer to that. I'd, I'd say do exactly the same. Um, the principles are exactly the same. Monobrand offering, customers are coming in, they're not shopping the whole store, they're picking what they want, uh, and through that choice, they're telling you something about themselves. Um, use that to understand them. Use that to make it easy for them to find what they want. Use it to understand what they're not buying from you uh, and give that to them. I, I don't think there's anything fundamentally different about the principles of customer centricity uh, between multi-brand and mono-brand. Um, you know, huge difference in the, the supplier relationships, clearly. Um, and uh, Sumit talked a lot of, or a little bit about you know, using data to build better relationships with suppliers, and that, that's clearly an element that's not going to work well. Uh, just to add a little bit from an Indian perspective, Simon, on this one, uh, he's right. Uh, uh, it's usually the big, big department stores, grocery, hypermarket guys who've been you know, one critical input is you need a, a source data. So anyone with a large loyalty program already in place is collecting that data. Uh, it's just a matter of using that data. What's been happening with a lot of single brand, and I can tell you uh, in the garment space, I, I personally am talking to a large garment manufacturer to get them to come on to this platform. Often it's the lack of the loyalty program. You know, a lot of people think that a loyalty program is an end in itself. That's not true. Loyalty programs is not what makes customers come back to you. It's, it's a piece of plastic. The customer comes for your store or for your brand, be it multi-brand or, uh, or single brand. Okay. And the customer doesn't actually come for those points. You know, those points are not so much in value that his life is going to fundamentally change. Yes, they are important and he must get them. So when you give away points to a customer, you take back data. And, you know, I think you'll see more and more of the single brand guys. Uh, I know for a fact in uh, my business, a lot of single brand companies are moving towards uh, loyalty program and hence action and insights from that loyalty program. Uh, I just wanted to know that typically the retail uh, could rather you just, loyalty program... Could you just take your name where you're from and then whom sure. you're directing the question to, please? Sure. It'll be a question to all the panelists because it's a more of a generic question. I am Shreemoy and I'm from the Lodha Group in Bombay. 
The typical loyalty programs we see in India are retailer driven typically and they are decided at a corporate level. Now, if from a mall's perspective, you don't want your customers to go to the new mall once, you know, a competition uh, arises over there, are there any examples internationally or specifically in India where retailers within a mall have collaborated together to come up with a loyalty program to ensure that people keep coming back to a particular retail center? And how can data be utilized there? Because um, you're collecting data at a retail spot. And correct me if I'm wrong, um, if in a mall, both a shopper stop and a pantaloons are there, you wouldn't want to share your data with the rest of the retailers there. It's your customer's data. So how can a mall at such a level use data to, you know, create an effective loyalty program? So uh, let me just make a little bit one, one addition to that is that there's always a win-win relationship that you're looking. So it's also the brands. So sometimes you're looking at bringing in the brand and the retailer also into that. So, but I'll, uh, Sumit, do you, do you want to first? Yeah, so so essentially there are many many ways to in my in my opinion there are many ways to skin the cat as it were. Uh, one way of looking at it is saying that okay, can I create a collaborative program? Very much you're like, like you're saying. When you're talking about sharing, and let's look at a real example. There are two competing retailers, and they don't want to share data. What are we talking about here? Sharing data. A, a live example, not in the same sense, is actually the program that he represents, for that matter. It's a much larger program. A multitude of retailers come together and drive a program together. Maybe there's a separate agency driving it or all of them coming together and driving it. What that does actually is build a program where I am not sharing what my, sh my shoppers are buying, but I know that he has come, this shopper has come to me on this date, which is in the mall, and has also shopped in four different places. These are the four stores that he's going to, but he's not going to the other eight. So the other eight can target this shopper to come to their store as well and give offer specifics to that shopper. So that could be one way of doing it. We actually do have a mall that is part of our coalition program. And actually, if you go into that mall, you know, you'll see Air Miles, which is our brand and currency there, pasted all over the place. And the, the mall operator actually funds that because there is a lot of competition between malls in, in, in Dubai. So it does make sense to go in and leverage the data. And it's like Sumit said, it's quite like a retailer, but at a, you know, retailer or retailers level across all your brands that are sitting there. And to answer, in a way, monogram, um, question is some of the best loyalty programs in this country go back 15 years and one of the best loyalty program was Indian Airlines right flying returns it was one of the best loyalty programs of this country so it's not the retailers who have done it a lot of other people have done it banks have done it beautifully since ages that's something which is there the question that comes is and 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 and, and, and since you represent a group where what I'm what I'm Seeking similarity between your question and his or her question that I have a customer whose purchase frequency is low. How do I ensure, should I therefore invest in a loyalty program or not? Or should I invest in loyalty? Forget about program. Should I invest, build loyalty among people? Should I build relationship? I can, I, and again, I'm, I'm using another word, which is almost, which is actually the base of loyalty is relationship. So should I invest in relationship? And here is again, I go back to this. If there is a switching costs are low, when customer shows churns, what is happening? If you, you find you find this happening in mobile industry also, huge amount of churn. Should I invest in a relationship or not? And that's where the question that Simon and everybody is saying that it's your belief. What do you want to do? Is your business built on relationships or money? Just ask that question. Are you throwing money to buy loyalty or are you creating loyalties? That's something which is there. But let's also understand here one thing that whenever we are talking of any of these, a lot of us talk about what we call an attitudinal loyalty, which means building an attitude, a favorable attitude to the brand or the store so that people come in. Are we making sure that people also that converts into behavioral loyalty? Is something which is there. Attitude and loyalty is easy to build, if you ask me frankly. It's a behavioral loyalty which is where data and everything starts coming, isn't it? So relationship, how do you convert relationships into a behavior is what is the challenge and that's where you have the big data coming and helping you out.
But I, I get slightly uncomfortable talking about attitudinal loyalty or emotional loyalty um, when we're talking about grocery retail. The, the, the fundamental truth is you're buying your groceries. It's not that exciting. It's not a sexy thing to do. And um, people do not form emotional loyalty with retailers. Um, they could form it with brands. Uh, they can form it with luxury goods retailers. Grocery, not so sure it's going to happen. But the behavioral loyalty side, absolutely. Um, if we give customers a world-beating store experience, if we make the products they want easy to find, if we give them the right promotions, the right targeting, that builds the behavioral loyalty. Uh, and the behavioral loyalty, that's enough. That's going to grow sales. And that's going to keep your customer base growing over time. And, you know, some of the things that we're talking about and you alluded to, Simon, was profitability. And is it, are you looking at acquisition or you're looking at actually building loyalty? So so that part is, is key in terms of where you're going with the uh, with your customer data, right? Is it more driven by acquisition? Hi, morning. Uh, my name is Abhishek Raina, and I represent Tata Communications Banking. I uh, would like to slightly shift from the retail or the mall uh, area. And we we are in the payment services space. So we deploy ATMs, we deploy POS for various banks end-to-end. -end. My question here is, uh, since our starting point is site selection, which is... So what we do is we are essentially a retail-oriented brand, but deploying ATMs, right? So the product is different. There's no engagement with the customer. It's just a transaction which is happening. The point I want to understand from the professor and the panelists is how do we know who's the consumer, knowing the fact that there will be multiple ATMs in and around the catchment that we will be uh, deploying ATMs in, and whether a brand that we represent, should we actually get into a loyalty understanding, knowing that it's purely transaction, it's cash withdrawal, it's balance inquiry, and stuff like that? I think you got it completely wrong. Because ATMs have the, huge, the most psychological advantage than a, than a transaction advantage. The fact that I can get money and I can do transaction anytime is a psychological factor. It's not transaction. And that's what I'm saying. We are so much worried about, we, are, we get so much carried away about it, and which is what the point I was to bring later, but let me bring it here. If you're talking of relationship and customer, change your views. You're looking at the business from this side, customer that side. Please change your views. You're a supplier. As, as long as you're looking at the pipeline from this side, you'll get this picture. Turn it around and you find the kaleidoscope to be very different. Please understand the value that the customer, dis the customer actually derives. And that is the core of the relationship, not the product, not the transaction. The fact that I don't have to carry cash is a psychological advantage. It's not a physical advantage. And so everything, I mean, if you look at it, we as human beings, if, if we assume that we have minds and there are two parts of the mind, there would always be a logical side of it and there would be a psychological side of it. You got to choose which way you want to work. As a human being, consumers as a human being never work with one side of the mind. They always work with both sides of the mind. And it's up to us what do we, what do we make out of it. Can we actually take the next question after this? Yeah, uh, we're going to start running out of time. Check. Uh, this question is for Vinay. My name is Anand, right here. Uh, I am from Tanishk. One, uh, congratulations, you have database for 19 years of your customers. So I just wanted to understand, obviously there are customers who are completely loyal to the business, but somewhere these loyal customers tend to peel off from the business, right? And I'm sure in the 19 years you would have actually found out that in the seventh year or eighth year, 30% of my loyal customers, I'm just giving an example, kind of peel off. So in your business, what insight did you have uh, which helped you to retain the customers who are loyal, but somewhere, for some odd reason, whether it is value proposition or whatever it is, they're peeling off. And how do you prevent that peeling off in a mature loyalty system? Oh, yeah. Uh, hi, Anand. And two parts. Interesting question. And, uh, you know, in our language, we call it uh, 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 activation program. Uh, you know, typically, if you see most loyalty programs have... Uh, what you call two-year activation rates of 80%, 85%. Yeah, but there is still a good 15 to 20% of your customers who don't come to you for two years, 24 months. 
Yeah, uh, you have various uh, people doing various kinds of programs, and uh, I think I would go with what uh, the professor said. You know, usually it's not just those. Uh, we, we have a program called a miss you program. So if you don't come to our store for 24 months, in the 25th month, you will get a communication saying we miss you. And of course, that's based on the tonality of our brand. It might differ from some other brand. Uh, we, we might send you a birthday cake to your house. Okay, what we've seen is we've sent discounts, we've sent vouchers. But often when we do what he talked about as a little bit more uh, uh, less functional, you know, suppose cake arrives to you without any cause or anything of that sort, uh, that's often, uh, you know, you uh, as an Indian and as any international world citizen, you, you feel a need to, you have some touch back with that store. We did this very interesting exercise with respect to uh, Gujarati customers. And are there any Gujaratis here in the audience today? I know Anish is a Gujarati in all likelihood. Yeah, I'm sure there are a couple of others there. You know, we realized that, uh, uh, you know, the minute you break down your group into community centric, so Bengali, etc. We look at Gujaratis, it was easy. We took top 500 surnames of Gujaratis from the net. And while this data may not be 100% accurate because, you know, Trivedi could be, maybe could be a Maharashtrian, it could be a Guju, but it's approximately correct for our purpose. We figured that in Bombay and a little bit in Pune, a good chunk of our business comes from the Gujarati community. And we said, okay, let's ask one more question. Uh, you know, Gujarati, and I can tell you there are a couple in the room and I'm half Guju myself, is very aware of the stock market. At any point in time, he will know till the last, uh, you know, probably rupee, what is his portfolio doing till the last minute. He may not be a day trader, but he's very aware. So he said, okay, let us correlate Sensex data with Gujarati customer data. You won't be surprised. We got fabulous correlations, but the problem was I have no way of predicting the Sensex, so how do I predict Gujarati community behavior? But what we did, and this is about 15 days back, all of you know that you know the market was at about 17,000 levels, about 20, 25 days back with the slew of announcements, including FDI, the market went up. We sent out a communication to our Gujarati customers, uh, okay, uh, telling them something to the effect of it's at a great times, come and shop. And the kind of activation levels that we got with that communication, okay, were fabulous because that guy was ready for our uh, communication. We did something similar for the Muslim community. Now we are doing something for the Bengali com community. So the minute you de-aggregate that activation level down into, you know, bite-sized pieces, there is a huge story available, uh, and it's not rocket science. You just go to Google, you pull out 500 Gujarati surnames, you go into your database, you pull out data for those surnames, and all you do is, uh, you know, try to, so there is not, no advanced uh, rocket science there. So loyalty is living and breathing program, right? I mean, that's why the customer is in the middle of it. One of the examples we had was with the, um, with the, with the sandwich and coffee shop uh, place in the U.S. that the customer would walk in and would get something called a surprise and delight. So they'll just walk in and would get, you know, you actually like a pastry with your sandwich. So ka -ching, here's your pastry with your free or half discount. So, so you can't really do loyalty in just one, one size fits all or one time fits all and then not, not continue it. I think we're running out of, uh... um, the trouble with doing that is that very often you end up with so much data and you, you create a correlation matrix and that correlation matrix will give you fantastic correlation numbers, uh, over things that might be completely unrelated in the real world. So how do you, and this is what I was, I was saying when, when I was introducing the session. How do you make sense of, of the data, not just the data that you get, but the parameters that they throw up, um, of the, the various data points that tell you you should be excited, uh, but it looks great on paper and all you're doing is spreadsheeting your way into happiness? Uh, yeah, that's a very relevant question and I think that's going to be top of the mind for a lot of people here, Anish. Uh, I'll give you our example. We sit on something like, four odd terabytes of data. I mean, we have a large chunk of data. And if we get into the data, we will actually sync. If we just, uh, the process we use and uh, is what we call a process of hypothesis. So you must not jump into the data. I mean, you could if you had all the time in the world, but you walk into the data with a hypothesis. So for example, the hypothesis could be that Muslim customers pre-Eid shop a lot. That could be a hypothesis. And the data will help you prove it right or wrong, or even simpler. Uh, the, the, the hypothesis could be that every time a man buys a shirt within one year of purchase, he must also buy a trouser. 
So the minute you'd start with a hypothesis, which is based often on observation, it's not to do with data. It's based on maybe a visit abroad, uh, standing in the store. Our best hypotheses have actually come out from observation. So you start with an observation because, you know, like he rightly said, correlation. You know, there's this famous example we studied, professor in stats, that the uh, correlation of the number of babies born in, let's say, Raipur is correlated to the number of let's say scandals uh, we are seeing on television lately, but while there's correlation, there may not be causation. So I think that observation will give you that uh, uh, causation to make some sense, but don't dive into the data. Go in with a hypothesis. You can always reject that hypothesis. You can accept it. Sometimes you can come back and modify it too. A very quick answer to that, and I think um, I agree with what Vin is saying. I think being hypothesis-led um, mitigates against the risk of kind of analysis going nowhere. Um, there's an expression that we use called analysis paralysis, and the way that you know, I think you avoid that is you don't let analysts do the analysis alone. Uh, you make sure that there's some business-focused people, there's some commercial people who are aware of what's going on and are involved uh, in the interpretation and the derivation of the analysis. In fact, just to add to that, Simon, what, uh, what we do is uh, the merchants drive that, for one, and two, we have, in addition to this, we have something which we call the train of thought analysis. So you sit with an analyst and say, okay, this is related to this. If this is so, then what is that? If that is that, then what is that? So there's a whole train of thought analysis and you spend a day there and what you come out are a bag full of insights, which then you over a period of time use. I think uh, my name is Chintan Chopra. So I'm, I represent Nokia. So my question is to Professor Sina. Uh, in our industry, in the telecom industry speci uh, specifically, so there are many operators, you know, who give different offers to both the existing customers as well as to the new customers. And in many cases, the offers to the new customers are more lucrative than what they offer to the existing subscribers. So my question is that how as a company you should ensure that a proper balance is maintained so that your, both your existing customers should feel that they are being taken care of properly and at the same time you're, you are, you are offering something really lucrative to attract the new consumers. I think you have hit the problem right there. <clears throat> And this is something, a question which I have to almost all, including us. The time that we spend segmenting new customers, do we do that with existing customers? Probably not. Probably not. So we assume the existing customers, that they are there, and that's what, that, that, therefore, let's go and, look and acquire the customer, and now that we have a scheme for a new customer, let me give it to other customers also. And the guys, uh, the disguise is, I'm rewarding loyalty. The fellow doesn't even need it, but we still want to give it. Right? So first thing of loyalty or loyalty or this is that we must differentiate between existing customers and new customers. And the difference is conceptually is very simple. Existing customer comes back to you with, on the basis of experience that the person has. As, a, as an existing customer, I don't look first to competition. First, I look back in my head to say how good this company has been to me. A new customer always looks around the competition and then decides. So the whole whole basis of decision making is different. And therefore, how can I have the same program running for the two 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 sets of customers? As simple as that. That's true, but uh, you know, uh, in many cases, what happens is that the existing customers feels that you know. Uh, the company is not uh, doing enough to, you know, take care of him. So, so, so that's exactly what it is. That means the person is not finding it relevant to what you're doing. As simple as that. The two, right? if I can add. So I need to be very, very careful about it in saying that. Uh, and let me also tell you, running a scheme is so very easy. But running a, a customer-centric program is very difficult because it is very implementation heavy. Throwing a, a promotion to the whole whole nine million customers is so very easy. One email and everybody gets it. But am I really get, getting sending relevant things like Vinay and others have been saying? If it is not relevant, after three emails, I'll put it in spam. Spam. After that, you have lost the existing customer also. So my request is, if at all you want to take advantage of the existing customers, it requires effort. I, and that's exactly one of the reasons why many people don't, don't even get into it, because it requires a very implementation-heavy program. It's not so easy to run. And it's expensive. It's not easy, cheap also to run. Therefore, it has to be strategic in nature. It can't be tactical. 
you can't be using a loyalty program for as direct marketing tools. It has to be fitting into my business strategy as to how do I reduce my cost of acquiring customers? How do I increase my return on marketing investments to the extent that can it help me get me ROCE, better ROCE of my business? If I'm not looking at that level, I'll still see it as a marketing program and I don't think we will ever reach the, 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 the results that we expect from them. I think the strategic difference is for a new customer, you're designing a program which is for reducing the cost of entry and it's towards brand trial you know, or service trial versus designing a program for existing customers is about increasing exit costs. So that's more about brand engagement. So you think of it that way, you will see completely different drivers for those customers and therefore have different offers. I have a question here. My name is Ashwini. It's uh, to Mr. Vinay Bhatia first. Uh, do you ever share any of your insights on the customers with your vendors? Anything with your brands that they can do something about their product mix? And second question is to the uh, Danambi gentleman. Is there this cap uh, category captaincy even in lifestyle stores abroad or is it just with the hypermarkets where you sell day-to-day, -day, you know, uh, transactions, uh, this transaction led not in lifestyle. So does that happen, the category captaincy and all of that? Does it happen abroad in lifestyle space? Um, on, on category captaincy, yes, it does. So some of the department stores that we work with would have category captains. And um, absolutely, there's a lot of insight and data sharing that goes on um, between the retailer and the category captain. Yeah, the, the, the most enlightened of the retailers that we work with, they embrace the fact that um, the suppliers, the manufacturers know the categories, know the brands a lot better than they do. Um, so suppliers bring in that brand category knowledge uh, and they bring it from the marketplace, not just from the retailer. But the retailer knows the store operations, they knows what works in store. Um, and then the, the Dunhumby Insight, we understand the customers, we know how to marry the two together. Uh, and when that works well, and it doesn't always work well, but when it does, uh, you do see spectacular results. Uh, hi, I'll just answer the first part of your question. And, you know, coincidentally, I have, uh, I think Amit Sarda is in this room. Can he raise his hand there? He's from a brand called Soul Flower, one of our partners at Shoppers. I coincidentally saw him uh, around the time you asked this question. And we did some work with uh, Soul Flower, which is one of our home uh, brands. And basically, he makes, uh, you know, various home refreshment uh, items. We did a lot of data sharing with, uh, with Amit and his team. And we talked to him about what is our home customer all about. Yeah, and we figured out, uh, we also did, a, we ran a program, we ran a actually very targeted offer to buyers who weren't buying Soul Flower, and we got fantastic results. So that was one part of it. I think on the product development that you mentioned, that's, a, that's an interesting question, a little bit complicated. I think one of the things we came out with in consonance with Amit and team, we figured a lot of behavior of customers is uh, zodiac sign based. Now, as corny as it may sound to you, you know, people do read the Linda Goodmans uh, of the world and, you know, Librans are supposed to behave in a particular way and Scorpios and all of that. And we actually figured, and I think he went ahead and did it, right? He went and made a range of, so we had a lot of data in terms of when our customers were born and we tried to do some amount of behavior mapping there and we figured he actually created a range for zodiac sign uh, based. And, you know, and it, I think that's done uh, pretty well for him. And these are some of the ways, but let me tell you that these are very limited collaborations. I think we need to do a whole lot more. Uh, we tend to do it for our own labels uh, in-house because, you know, it gets a lot easier. So we developed a range for uh, New Year, Christmas period a couple of years back based on listening to our loyalty customers and listening to our Facebook customers. Because even that's emerging as a, you know, in a sense, a very engaged uh, audience. So I would say we are at the on the tip of the iceberg of using it for product development, but we've taken some few baby steps in that area, and I think they've been fairly successful. At Sainsbury's, is actually a very, very uh, established program. So there's, you know, it's, it results in hundreds of millions of dollars. We share SKU level, customer level consumption data with 150 FMCGs that supply products, you know, from the PNGs and Unilever of the world to Sainsbury's. And uh, it actually translates into coupons at till. So when you actually go and shop at your shopping basket and you exit based on your past history and based on that basket, we'll serve you an offer right there. So, you know, you have been a Pepsi customer. You bought Pepsi again today. I will might serve you a Coke offer right there. And it's actually uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars for the FMCGs and the retailers involved. It's quite established. Hi. Uh, 
Yeah, this is Siju. Uh, I look after Smarter Commerce for IBM. Just wanted to check on one thing. Um, there's a lot of data that you obviously are leveraging, and that's very nice. Uh, am I correct in assuming that majority of this data is actually structured data or data that you're getting from a point of sale? Yeah. Uh, now, in today's scenario where social media is obviously a given, whether we like it or not, and hence a lot of unstructured data. Even we don't, we don't even need to go to the social media angle. If you were to look at conversations that a customer perhaps has with the store associate, is unstructured data. And that's a wealth of data that comes in. Does that get captured at your end? And does that become a part of analysis? And the second part is of the obvious uh, unstructured data store that we have in terms of the social media interactions. Are those also captured? Do we intend to capture them? And uh, or are these just a flash in the pan and they don't really necessarily go into making uh, good data an analysis? Uh, yeah, Shibu, hi. On the first part of your question, uh, it is structured. So uh, we, we, we have a system called the CFS system where we collect every piece of customer feedback is actually put into our data warehouse. We collect about four and a half lakh uh, customer complaints, suggestions, uh, compliments, etc. in the course of the year. So that is pretty structured. And I think that's an important question that you asked. On the second part, for example, we run a Facebook page with about 3.6 million customers, very large uh, amount of uh, data. We are still struggling with and trying to figure out ways of, you know, in a sense, deduping our loyalty customer to our social media customer where we want to reach. And in fact, this is an example I have actually given as a brief to our uh, agency who's working on this, is that, uh, for example, during New Year, we, Shopper Stop on its Facebook page, ran a pledge competition. So, you know, you can pledge something for the New Year. It's almost like a New Year resolution everyone makes. Now, I'd love to know that, you know, Shibu, for example, wrote a New Year resolution about losing weight and joining a gym. If Shibu is part of my loyalty program and I have you deduped, I could send you a communication based on your, what you wrote on my homepage that you want to, you know, lose weight. I could send you a communication on the host of sportswear or gym wear that I stock. Okay, I could take it further. I could keep tracking you and, you know, maybe when you lost 15 kilos, you might come back on the net and say, hey guys, I've lost 15 kilos. I could then pitch you a new wardrobe. Okay, I'd love to do stuff like that. But uh, I think maybe guys like you, IBM, and you know, these are the people who have to help us integrate. Uh, that integration is a sitting duck. But I think we need to figure this one out. Yeah, I'm, I'm similar actually. That I think a lot of retailers are just waking up to the power um, in social networking data. And I'm not aware of anybody that's really using it very well at the moment, but people are kind of starting to think, what systems do I need? What kind of analysis do I need to make sense of it? Um, the immediate application is in the field of personalization. Um, somebody's social network, how they're using it, how many people they use it for, the kind of things they say, kind of contacts they make, is gold dust in terms of designing the online experience, you know, from what people see when they log on to the products that they're offered, um, to the kind of opportunities to share the experience with their friends. Um, we are seeing a lot of movement in the gamification uh, of the retail experience. So quite a lot of retailers are releasing apps um, which make shopping a bit more fun. Um, the one that I personally got involved in is something called the King of Cheese. Um, and it's a very simple competition where you, you kind of take on your friends or you take on strangers purely in terms of how much cheese uh, you're eating in a given week and the breadth of cheese that you're eating, not the size of it, but the number of different SKUs. Um, and it's fun, you know, it, it really is a, an interesting way to pass time, but it, it opens up the door to a whole other area of the customer's life, which retailers are not used to touching on. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's going to be the way of the future. It's fascinating. I think we'll have to cut it short. I'd like to thank the panelists.